Welcome back to Sunless Skies. In the last episode, we discovered what I believe is the last port in Albion, and I think the only port in Albion that we didn't discover before the Wayfarer update, Whirlberry Juxta Mare. We have a lot to do here. Let's explore it. Palace Pier. Workers in neat uniforms guide your locomotive to rest. Tourist engines rest alongside trading engines. Crews trade gossip and delicacies. Signs and block capitals make abundantly clear that this is a place for pleasure. Whirlberry Juxtamare dazzles like a... I'll try to pronounce that. I'm going to go with Faberge. <laughs> That's probably not right. Like a Faberge egg, lamp lit, rich brass, and Britain in Baroque. In the distance, carnival music mixes with faint cheering. A queue twists and snarls along the dock. Visitors are not allowed to just stroll into the port. They must be admitted. Every fortnight, the Bureau of Entertainment holds a lottery to give out a number of pauper's passes which grant free admittance. The queue for these is long, but it's not the only way into the port. The Bureau of Entertainment? A lottery for tickets? Huh. Bypass the queue at the insistence of the authorities. Hmm. If I had five Ministry Approval Literature, I could bypass it that way. That's pretty expensive. What is this? Properly cage your unidentifiable squirmings. It'll trade your unidentifiable squirmings for caged catches. Is that something that I get here? These unidentified squirmings? Because I've never heard of those before. Well, I guess there's nothing else I can do other than try to bypass the queue at the insistence of the authorities. A fox-jawed man, smartly dressed in cobalt, takes notice of you. He crooks a finger. First time visiting Whirlberry Juxtamare, huh? Come on, come over then. The representative of the Bureau of Entertainment introduces himself. We are a department of the Ministry of Public Decency, but we're entirely autonomous. We run this port for the benefit of weary travelers. They're part of the Ministry of Public Decency? Shit. He leads you past a queue that doesn't even bother to grumble. Yes, yes, I know. Queue jumping is terribly uncouth. But would you really rather be mingling with the proletariat when you could be enjoying our port? And I'm sure once you've seen what we have to offer, you'll need to come back again. He leads you to a fitting station. Everyone goes through this. There's a dress code. The Bureau of Entertainments wishes to encourage industrious captains to patronize the port. To this end, on a captain's first visit, they're allowed in in both without charge and without having to queue. Ah, one free visit. Okay. Clothes for the promenade. The couturier is exquisitely attired. Burgundy tailcoat. Cravat, brocaded vest in iron and ink, breeches, boots, and a smile like a shark. Periodically, he checks a brass pocket watch, while, gr while his grin lengthens and diminishes in turns. He is here to supervise the attire of new visitors to the port. In Whirlberry, everyone dresses up in the heady styles of 50 years ago. The Bureau of Entertainments provides suitable attire for all visitors. What article of clothing are you going to base your choice of outfit around? Your choice of outfit has no impact on the port. It is merely an outlet for your whimsy. God, this place sounds insufferable. Run by the public, the Ministry of Public Decency. Or a spinoff of it or whatever. Forced a dress code. A shitty dress code at that. Mm. Receive an explanation. Sure. They flick a glance at you. I'm sure you know the spiel, but I'm obliged to repeat it. In a droll voice, the Cotier, I'm just going to say Cotier, who could be anywhere between 17 and 39, explains. Whirlberry Juxtamare is the perfect holiday destination, enhanced by visitor adherence to the dress code. Do not fear, it is all to enhance the experience you have while with us. In addition, and as a reassurance about the stringless nature of our generosity, I should inform you. 
The mists are corrosive and will eat through your regular garments. We provide access to a full wardrobe of coats, waistcoats, frock coats, dresses, dress shirts, breeches, boots, bustiers, and more to ensure your own remain intact. We love to see familiar faces. It wouldn't do to put you off. Now, pick one item and I'll choose you an outfit that suits it. A hat, a dress, dress shirt, why not both? Finely tailored coat, a skirt, or maybe a kilt, or bustle, or breeches, fabulous footwear, or back out. Mm. A dress, dress shirt, why not both? Awaiting your attention are armoires heaving with lace and leather, silk and cashmere, everything that had ever elicited the envy of another. Co this is this is related to co couture, right? Couture, but it's got more on it. Couturier? Couturier? I don't know. The person who gives people coutures? Designs couture? I don't know. The couturier deploys two gangly youths, both pale with eyes like the death of the day. <laughs> Sunset colors to complement their uniforms. I hope you won't mistake this for a common establishment, comrade. Wear anything you want. There are no rules here. No matter what you do, it feels like the Coutier's assistants are there first, whisking your picks away to resize for your frame. They tug and tease at collars, lace up corsets with grace, adjust folds and hems so that every angle cuts like a cruel word. When you finally dismiss the youths, the Couturier considers you for a long moment. He turns to a wardrobe and hands you several garments, all your size. Once you're dressed, he dismisses you, shooing you into Whirlberry Juxtamare. The condition of your clothes will limit your time in Whirlberry. Ah, okay. Right, the corrosive mists. How frayed is our stuff allowed to get before we're just like forced out? Are we gonna, are we gonna end up naked? <laughs> hmm. There's more to Whirlberry Juxtamare than meets the eye, I'm sure. Mm, this first one's really important. Meet the new streetline passenger in the haunted house. Your contact said you could find one of her passengers acting as the murderous butler. Yeah, this is for the person that's running away from the Brabazon work world. I'm supposed to pick him up and take him somewhere safe. Let's do that first. You unlock this with a tired for Willowberry Juxtamare. You have five in all. So I can maybe do five turns. Yeah, let's do it. The haunted house is a coarse artifice populated by actors who you wouldn't even cast in a pantomime. The white lady leaves flowery footsteps wherever she glides. The chef offers you a set of unconvincing pies she claims were made from the previous visitors. And in the library, an old, dour man lurks with a feather duster in one hand and a cleaver in the other. You present the murderous butler with a new street line ticket. His tears, for the first time in this house, are genuine. You hurry him to your engine. The next stop for him is Lustrum. Your clothes have a shine to them as if abraded into softness. Oh, what is this? Locate maudlin poets for the incognito princess. God, there's so much to do. Like, I want to get a port report because I always want to get a port report, but that's far from the most important thing to do, really, if it's going to take up my precious time here. Let's do this for the incognito princess. A series of somberly clad people with scarves and aggressive rhyme schemes gather around a public house. This must be the meeting place of the celestial-inspired poets the incognito princess wishes to see. I have to be honest, I don't remember the princess asking for this. I'm sure they did, I just don't remember it, and I can't go speak with them right now without leaving this place entirely. No matter, let's do it. You squeeze in the back. There are rows of serious young folk before you. 
poets take the stage to chart their woe at the working class's plight. Or at least that's what you presume. From their gestures, they're inaudible over the chattering of the chattering classes. The incognito princess is pressed against the back wall. She ignores the rats who assemble to paw worshipfully at her feet. I would rather be closer, she states. Hmm. Impersonate the gentlefolk of the press. Poets are addicts for coverage, convincing them that your critics will get you a better position. You locate the best dressed poet and explain who you write for. Her face flushes with excitement and you're hurried to a prime position. You look up at a poet staring into the middle distance, describing the misery of the hour looms. Slowly, he becomes aware of the incognito princess, stutters, and changes tact, or tack, rather, hailing her majesty in celestial verse. Soon, another poet steps on the stage, adding her own thoughts on how extraordinarily well the princess compares to the first day of spring, then a third, then a fourth. The princess takes a break from the attention of the poets and turns to you. I will meet you back on the locomotive, she says. Wait, wait for just one more. No, you're not going home yet. Let's see what the princess is up to. Yes. Yes. Let's see what they're up to. You push back into the public house to see every poet in the room hailing the incognito princess, trying to find couplets to exactly chart the bounds of her perfection. Not so blue now, my sad rhymers, she says, waving encouragingly at the poets. You can find the words, if not English, perhaps words more celestial. After a brief moment, they find a language whose shapes sound ill-fitted for a human palate. They rush on joyously. One poet's tongue ignites, then another, then a third. Soon every poet has a mouthful of flame and still they don't stop. In the middle of the conflagration stands the princess beaming. This seems to be contagious. Best run. What the fuck? Hmm. They, so... The incognito princess wants them, is encouraging them to speak in correspondence. Is very, very happy about hearing correspondence. What is going on? Your clothes are soft and comfortable as if many years worn. I've lost one heart. Ooh. Gained a searing enigma and gained 20 terror. Glad I stayed. Hmm. Well, I gotta finish here before I can go speak with the princess, so... Mm. Wander onwards. This will reduce your tired for Whirlberry Juxta Mare, but may open up new opportunities. God, what do I do? I, a path to the beach? A charming tea room? A tiny lane bedecked with shops? Um, let's go to a tiny lane bedecked with shops. A babble of shops and stalls sears the gaze with bold, mismatched colors. The house of Hugh might be a jewelry store, or it may instead be where one purchases men, men named Hugh. It's hard to say. <laughs> Inside, it is quiet as a museum, and there are gorgeous men relaxing in roped-off areas, drenched in jewelry. It is not worth risking the scandal. You gab with a pink-cheeked mother instead. Your clothes are thinning and tattered. They will not remain suitable attire much longer. Hmm, the longer you spend in Whirlberry Juxta Mare, the easier it is to spot the flaws in the facade. There, another detail not quite right. This whole place is a facade? I mean, it is related to the Ministry of Public Decency, so like, I would expect it to be a shitty place.
Hmm. Ooh, consider the strangeness of the lanes. We can now investigate it. The lanes do not appear as advertised, but of all their sins, that one is the least phantasmagoric. This enables you to investigate the weirdness of Whirlberry Juxta Mare and offers a potentially rewarding opportunity. 100% chance of success. It's most likely the smiles. Maybe. Carnivore expressions. Syrupy and gleaming. Faultless mirrors of the couturier's dazzling grin. Or maybe it's the second-rate souvenirs cobbled from haberdashery and children's nightmares. <laughs> the arsenic aftertaste of the candy floss. The wine-wild quality of the local perfumes. Could be anything. Could just be your insecurities. The error of your existence. Whatever the case, the lanes continue their watch. Politely, of course. As you become familiar with the oddities of Whirlberry, more of the port will become available to you. In a place so bright and joy-filled, it's easy to be distracted. Whatever it was you'd noticed about Whirlberry Juxta Mare, it's gone now. Gained a savage secret, cord of Corister Nectar, and Salon Stute Gossip. My clothes are threadbare, I'm scruffy. So I think I can do one more thing. Hmm. Wander onwards? Nothing here catches your eye. Whirlberry Juxtamer is precisely like every other weekend destination. Shabbier than advertised and bristling with ways to spend more money than intended. As you spot what is not right, you start to see what is actually there. Oh, yeah, now we have to leave. Oh, but I can still do a port report. Okay, maybe that doesn't take up time. Those who are anybody and those who are nobody come here to relax. The port's comings and goings could be informative. In the face of candy floss, guards are let down. Presented with this much tea, defenses are dropped. This should have been a good place to gather information. Unfortunately, the screams of the donkeys render eavesdropping impossible. Still, even by itself, a list of visitors is certainly worth something. Leave. Cold frissons down your spine, dragging your attention southwards. Oh dear, your clothes are in tatters. Your beautiful garments are nothing but rags now. Well-dressed onlookers gawk and giggle, whisper and point. You look bedraggled, shabby, and worst of all, unfashionable. Hmm. Oh, prove you're permitted to enter with a ministry stamp permit. Well, I got ten of those. Oh yeah, so I can do a bunch of different things to get in now. Three uncanny, st or two uncanny specimens. Yeah, that's not a good thing to do, because I only have three. I'm so low. I can just straight up pay. 250 sovereigns. Uh, this enables you to both skip the queue and avoid donating to the port authorities. It's ludicrously overpriced, but perhaps you can afford it. I can't afford it, but no thanks. And then all these other things that I can't do. Um, let's see what they are, though. Prove you know the right sorts. You need to have this at least four before you can use your favor with the chairman. Have this? What is this? But anyway, I'm not doing anything for the chairman. I think that's the, the shit back at Port Prosper, right? So I'm never going to have favor with them. can also gain admittance with Nostalgia Crockery. I have a shit ton of that. Back in the bank, of course. Mm. Mm, yeah, this isn't for entrance, the five Ministry of Proof Literature. This is for a condemned experiment. Okay. Well, prove you're permitted to enter Whirlberry with a permit. The Ministry admits its own, and you have the necessary paperwork. The official scans your permit carefully, nods, then clicks his fingers twice. Workers from the Bureau of Entertainments quickly commandeer your attention. A man and a woman appearing on each side, both exquisitely dressed, their smiles well-wetted knives. 
Come, come already. The Cotier doesn't like waiting. You need an outfit. Come, come, come. Uh, so yeah, this is the same as before, of course. Just choose my outfit. Hmm. A finely tailored coat, draped across an army of smiling porcelain mannequins, is an armament of coats in every size, all sumptuously designed, all perfect, just like you. This description is actually a little bit different than it was before. The coat... I still don't know how to pronounce that. I think I pronounce it differently each time. Couture. Couture... Couture, Couture. The Couture calls two women from a door you hadn't realized was there. They're tall, sinewy, and sapia skinned, with the bluest eyes. As before, as always, my assistants will do everything they can for you, comrade. The women are efficient but impersonal, their attention bereft of interest. Whenever you attempt to don something that doesn't quite fit your ensemble, they remove the offending garment and replace it with an inventory of superior options. When you finally dismiss the women, the couturier, I, <laughs> I'm just going to say couture, how about that? The couture considers you for a long moment. He turns to a wardrobe and hands you several garments, all your size. Okay, and that's the same. Let's do the path to the beach. No trip to Whirlberry is complete without a jaunt along the beach. You should stroll down to the shore where the mists wait in glittering coils. This is a beach? Of course it is a beach. What else could it be? It is a stretch of pale particulates and roiling mists. The air smells of salts and things that mummified in the sun, of cinnamon and licorice. It's pebbles and grains of blue glass, tendrils of something curious and organic, worm-like growths, tufting through the sediment. This is exactly what beaches are. I'm not sure about the worm-like growths. Uh, let's head back to the... Arcade? That must be a different meaning of arcade than the one I'm thinking of. You lazily wander back towards the arcade, your clothes soaked from proximity to the mists. So, Tiny Lane Bedecked bedecked with shops we've done beach we've done charming tea room i don't think we did that tea is always a good idea in a universe of horrors tea is never wrong nothing but tea is served in this low ceiling candle lit room which is succulent with the smell of sandalwood and white lotus you pick something black and bitter and take a seat at the table opposite a train's triumphant crew it appears traditional for patrons here to abscond with a piece of crockery, a mug, a delicate teacup, a saucer. Whatever best reminds them of the tea room. As such, you do the same. No reason to be impolite. Okay, so we spotted something wrong. We spotted something wrong, but this time we can't examine the lane. So maybe we need to wander onwards. Open up new opportunities. Let's see. Mm, no, nothing here. Succumb to the wiles of a rubbery lumps cellar. <laughs> Love those lumps. Another path to the beach. Hmm. Well, let's do the uh, rubbery lumps. A wax paper cone brimming with rubbery lumps sounds just about perfect. It dates precisely as advertised. Hot, rubbery, faintly sweet, with a dashing of, of marin and brown sugar, and an aftertaste reminiscent of roasted berries, like a memory of better days. You graze on a palm full of lumps before you put the rest away. I like that they use the word graze. Mm, so that's two de details we've spotted, apparently. Take a donkey ride. Hell yeah. Three sovereigns? I don't know if I can afford that. No trip to Whirlberry is complete without a donkey ride. 
A man in a candy-striped suit bellows, while his donkey drools a string of iridescent tumors. How can you resist? What the fuck? Okay. Yeah, sounds great. You enjoy a pleasant donkey ride along the shore. The rolling motion of the beast's four unequal legs is soothing, and the complimentary earplugs block out all but their most shrill hunting screams. You return to the panic of nervous customers intact, and only moderately traumatized. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Ruminate on the nature of donkeys. That sounds good. Oh yeah, that's part of the investigation thing. They are very earthy animals. But where has their ordure gone? The extraneous entrails they've shed, the vomit, none of it is ever anywhere to be found. What the fuck? Um... It's funny that it, it's painting the picture of the real mystery is like where the vomit and the extra entrails have ended up. They just seem to disappear. That's the odd part. And not the fact that they're just drooling out tumors and entrails and vomit everywhere. I think that's the odder part. Let's do it. Success. For all of the sounds that the donkeys make, for all the viscera they disgorge, all the creatures they disembowel, they seem to be remarkably sanitary creatures. No trace of the refuse is to be seen anywhere. The beach remains spotless. But there, look. A donkey is vomiting ropes of grey intestine into, onto the sands. Surely now bile and blood will reveal themselves, except they don't. The air flickers and once again everything is completely hygienic. What the fuck? Otherworldly artifact, barrel of unseasoned hours, two tales of terror. Five terror, a sky story. What the hell is wrong with this place? Yeah, we have to go. Before I head back in, let's go speak with the incognito princess. Actually, let's close this because it's getting pretty laggy. Yeah, taking a good couple seconds. Like five seconds just to close that. Ask what happened at the poetry reading. A stoker whispered that the inn burned down, killing all the poets. Oh my god. Is this true, your highness? No, it's not true, captain, says the incognito princess, lounging on a mound of dead starlings roughly shaped like a chase lounge. She gestures at the floor. Crouching beside the analytical suitor is a gaunt man with wild eyes. My poetical suitor survived, she says. You really should not listen to gossip. It's no time for gossip. My journey now takes a more serious bent. She then explains her next destinations. Firstly, she has to find a crossroads in Eleutheria. She's of the opinion they're often south of the transit relay where one arrives. A crossroads, what does that mean? You'll require an unlicensed chart there. Secondly, a trip to see the devils in Kurilin on the matter of rings. She might need a handful of bee souls for that. Bee souls? How do I get bee souls? I, huh? Coarser nectar's not bee souls, is it? You'll need three Corster B souls to acquire it. What? How? Huh? Huh. So I want to mention that at this point, Elizabeth is just, like, scared of the Incognito Princess. They liked them, but what they're seeing is just terrifying. I don't think they want to romance the princess anymore. Not at the moment. Let's go back in. I wonder if the description for the assistants are going to be different again. Mm. Oh, right. They don't come out yet until I pick something. Uh, a hat. 
What a dizzying cornucopia of grotesquely perfect millinery. Millinery? London would weep in envy. Summon a pair of pale children, their stained glass eyes, a palette of emerald golds. Yeah, that's different again. His assistants are as attentive as they are silent. Reverently, they offer possibilities in flattering headgear. Fascinators, bowlers, top hats, even veils filigreed with milky blue seed pearls and roses the red of a broken heart. When you finally dismiss the children, uh, yeah, that's all the same now. So many different assistants. Well, what is this? Clamber through the gnarled door. I unlock this with Whirlberry Weirdness 2. Yeah, let's do that. I don't think I want another donkey ride. The door slides like a thief into the periphery of your vision, too short to enter unless you crawl. You pry the door open. Inside is the throat of a short tunnel. Connective tissue, really. Leading out into a star-swallowed twilight. A canal slicked with juices that cannot so much be seen as felt. Your journey begins here. Push through to the other side. You press down. It sticks to you. Vernix and the warm reek of intestinal meat. Gelatinous and in insistent that you remain where you are. Is this whole place some sort of creature that somehow, like, Oh, how, what is it eating? I don't think it's killing people, is it? Is it somehow eating? Uh, I don't know. I don't know enough. Perhaps it is the Sisyphean nature of the travel. Perhaps it's carelessness. Whatever it is, the voice of a man ahead of you, salt dry and salt cold, comes as a surprise. You're late for the sermon too, he hisses. We mustn't be late for the sermon. His hand grasps yours, tugs you through a translucent membrane, across the path, through church doors. You don't have time to observe the port. The air seizes you, cold as a corpse's kiss, and something about it is wrong. Whispers in a voice like water. The bedraggled parson stands before his people, palms raised. Today we stand before they who must grieve, to give praise to their sacrifice. Without them, there would be no joy, no agony against which we might juxtapose the sweetness of our existence. Do not ever forget this. If you forget all else, do not forget this. He raises his eyebrows at you. A pleasure to see a new member. But please join us later on the beach. Huh. They're praising they who must grieve. They who must grieve. Without them there'd be no joy, no agony against which we might juxtapose the sweetness of our existence. So is that why everything is so nice here? It's all about happiness and joy and just like a, a pleasure place? Is to create some sort of juxtaposition against something agonizing? Listen to the murmuring sermon. Was it, um, you unlock this with a sermon timer. You have three in all, so I can only do three things, or talk to the cultist to your right, talk to the cultist to your left. Um, hmm. Let's listen to the sermon. You find a seat among the parishioners, their skin whirled with strange patterns, tentacular calligraphy that might quite possibly be flesh. The bedraggled parson paces across his stage, lit up from behind by his reverence, his conviction in the sutras of his speech. Here is a man assured in his precise place in the universe. And remember, Next Tuesday, a baptism in the, at the mists. All those looking to experience a closer connection with they who must grieve come down to shore. Okay.
Okay. Should I listen further? Let's talk to the cultist to my right. You lean over to whisper to a diminutive old woman, her hair swaddled in gold filigree. Diminutive, I think is how it's pronounced. Diminutive. Upon closer inspection, it becomes evident that it isn't hair that sits atop her skull, but thousands of delicate cilia. Still, aside from that one anomaly, the woman seems normal and generous with her attention. I like coming here. The parson's got a good heart. No idea what he's trying to say sometimes, but he's got a good heart. He wants us to rise up, rise beyond who we are and what we are. We've just got to give ourselves to they who must grieve. That's how I got this. She strokes her hair in the mists. She leans in. But honestly, I'm only here because the parson's a pretty one. <laughs> Thousands of delicate cilia. Let me look up what cilia is. Mm. A cilia is... It's a type of organelle found on eukaryotic cells and are slender protuberances that project from the much larger cell body. So in this context, I think it basically means they're a bunch of very fine, basically like fleshy hairs, like soft, tiny little kind of hair type things sticking out. Huh. Hmm. Talk to the cultist to your left. You share a quick dialogue with a restless seeming individual of indeterminate age, gender, and species. Hello. They burble gently at you. Their voice like a chorus of brooks. You're new. When they speak, you can see that they do not in fact have tongues, but a mouth like the inside of an intestine, soft with pale villi, or villi. Perhaps that is why they sound the way they do. The Bureau does not like me in Whirlberry Juxtamare. They don't even like me in the off-season. But I have seen they who must grieve, and I will remember that day always. It transformed my body, my mind, my heart. Okay, that's the second, like, biological term that we've heard. Villi. They're small finger-like projections that extend into the lumen of the small intestine. I don't know what the lumen is. Uh, anyway, I think the important point is that we've seen and heard a lot of things that are Fletch, fleshy and biological and like the inside of a body in a bunch of different ways, like the donkey coughing up intestines and stuff and, and tumors and the people having like eukaryotic cell organelle things on their head or in their mouth being soft with pale villi like the inside of an intestine. Like what is going on? The bedraggled parson stands before his people, palms raised. He clears his throat, but before the part... That's a new word. Parturition. The act of giving birth to young. Childbirth. Formal, technical is what it says is the type of word it is. Parturition. He clears his throat, but before the parturition, the birth of the first syllable, officials from the Bureau of Entertainment swarm into the chapel, howling like blood-drunk wolves. An unexpected intrusion. There's little resistance from the congregation, merely an affected resignation. The officers from the Bureau of Entertainments are civil as they evict the crowd. Once they've surmised that you do not belong, the officers leave you largely alone, occupying themselves instead with the task of extricating the parishioners. The bedraggled parson's disciples cooperate with only minimal contempt, moving where they're told, answering questions when they're asked. All in all, a courteous disruption. Come on then, let's go, let's go. The rictus smiles of the officers are identical in their splendor, as is the exquisiteness of their uniforms, the oiled shine of their dark hair. The Bureau of Entertainment is the branch of the Ministry of Public Decency responsible for the well-being and upkeep of Whirlberry Juxta Mare. They take their duty seriously. 
Go quietly or bolt from the officials. Let's bolt from them. <laughs> Saw this. You flee from the Bureau of Entertainment. Uh, enforcers who are quite naturally aghast by your audacity. This is not Whirlberry as you know it. This without glitz, glamour, or a single tourist, barring yourself. The port lies sprawled under a sky now cataracted with milky nebulae. None of the familiar constellations are in sight, and every building's a bone and nod to the marrow. Despite the dilapidation, the place bustles with grim activity. And the smell, the cloying putrescence of it, a stink of hay and fecal matter brined in a miasma of dead marine life, copper, and fresh bread. Ugh. God damn, that's a good sentence. A stink of hay and fecal matter brined in a miasma of dead marine life, copper, and fresh bread. The off-season. Whirlberry Juxtamare has become a corpse. The run-down bones of its forgotten attractions swarm with bedraggled men and women, all armed with cleaning equipment. This is where the workers of Whirlberry live and labor to create the gaudy frontage seen by tourists. The beach is now a decaying mess, visited only by the cultists who attend the chapel there. To linger here, you'll need to work, but labor is poorly paid. Take other workers' jobs too often, and they'll firmly encourage you to depart. What the fuck? I can use a ministry stamp permit to go back to the tourist part of Whirlberry, but no, we need to explore this. How do we get back to the off-season? Feed the lanes. Sure. Feed the kitchens of the lanes. How else do you expect them to satisfy customers? The act of feeding the lanes is actually quite menial. Once you become accustomed to the mucus slicked, uh, mu mucus slick ducts, the way they tendril across your hands in pursuit of victuals, it really becomes quite boring. In one end, out presumably the other. To maintain a low profile here, you need to work, but while you're laboring, someone else is unemployed. Go for a walk along the beach. You can scarcely see the beach in the off-season. So dense are the mists. Beneath your feet, something crunches and cracks. Whirlberry Juxta Mary is shattered beams and broken stone, and the beach is a stretch of filth clotted in stinking clumps. Even here there is work to be done, you could assist. Divest the donkeys of their eggs. What do donkeys have to do with eggs? Let's go visit the cult. The bedraggled parson issued you an invitation. No reason to be rude. Their chapel lies on the beach at the edge of the mist. It is wefted tendons and yellowing bone, the pew's muscle cured in salt. It's amazing how spacious this place is, given the exterior. From the outside, it looks like just another corpse washed onto the shore. Have a word with the parson. Finally, a gash in the crowd. You go up to speak with the parson. His voice is water, warm, hypnotic. They were kind to you, the bedraggled parson says, abruptly and without vitriol, only a pale wonder, eyes fever warm under the wilds of his hair. It is all he extends. Was he talking about the officials from the Bureau of Entertainments or someone else? Anything more to say? Nope. Agree to a request recruiting for the cult. Uh, sure. Do 
I want to conspire with the cult? Hmm. I don't think I do. Let's divest the donkeys of their eggs. The donkeys here aren't enthroned in feces, but they require attention nonetheless. Ah. Uh, the donkeys are infertile. A flint-eyed woman reassures you. None of these eggs will ever reach fruition. The zygotes strangle themselves in the sack, but they do need to be flensed or flensed from the donkeys. Otherwise, there's the risk of rot and worse. You spend a few hours with a knife, gingerly paring the eggs from the underside of their bellies. They come apart in clusters, soft and milky gray, their inhabitants silvery and still. Huh. Huh. Okay. Your immediate employer seems content enough with your work. The laborer you replaced, less so. Mm, back to the off-season. The off-season is grime and a glazing of filth on every surface. The reek of manure and a steeping of piss in the air. But it's better than its beach. So, fed the lanes. Hmm. I guess I can either help out the colt or assist with the shoveling. Let's do that. You'd always understood that donkey excrement has to go somewhere. Apparently that place is here. Ooh, failure. The trustulent looking woman comes over again. Without preamble, she explains that you are to harvest organs of serviceable quality and put them aside for the cleaning crew. Worth its weight in gold, she growls, as you unspool coils of intestine from a knee-high pile of excrement. Once satisfied with your performance, she abandons you again. Okay, what if I do that again, but I succeed? A grumpy woman wastes little time on exposition. She passes you a shovel, a few words of advice, and jabs a gloved finger at a seething mound beside you. Try not to breathe deeply. Over the course of the next few hours, you discover two things. The first is that donkey feces, once it starts burning, smells curiously like tea. The second is that it occasionally fruits malformed viscera, an occasional eyeball or six. The work is nightmarish, but you survive to the end of your shift. You'll never smell the same again. You're not one of the usual off-season workers. You do not belong here. I think I have to leave now? Yes, forced to leave. The locals have had enough of you scavenging for their scraps. It is easier to leave the off-season than it is to enter. You're led to impressive cathedral doors, ornate slabs of polished wood that are twice as tall as a normal man. They appear to be adhering to nothing at all. The locals scowl at you, arms crossed, a horseshoe of shabbily dressed bodies preventing escape. Don't take our damn jobs. There's not enough to go around. Their single-minded labor is not out of pride for the pristine sight of Whirlberry, but out of desperate necessity. Okay. Now we're back here. Bribe your way through the door to the off-season, so we can just straight go to the off-season with a crate of munitions. Or just pay to go there. Only 60 sovereigns, not expensive at all. Hmm. What the fuck is this place? I'm just, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. Could this be like a messenger body disguised as this place? Look, all this nasty viscera and everything. Just kind of makes me think of the body that we've been in at the House of Rods and Chains, but I don't know. I doubt it. Okay, well, I think I'm going to end the episode there. <laughs> So I hope you've enjoyed so far, and when I return, I'm going to explore more of Whirlberry Juxtamare.